Thank you for the introduction, Katie. I appreciate the opportunity to share some of our experience with regards to measuring natural gas to achieve higher process efficiencies with everyone with us today. Today we'll be taking a quick look at industrial process applications that utilize natural gas as a fuel source, review four factors that can impact process efficiency, touch on the basics of thermal mass flow technology for natural gas measurements, and then wrap up with audience questions. By the end, I hope that all of us will have a greater appreciation of the benefits that a properly selected instrument will provide. When it comes to industrial processes, experienced instrument and controls engineers and technicians agree that the use of natural gas as a fuel source continues to grow. Applications can be found in practically every industry segment as illustrated here. If a process involves heat, most likely it is being fueled by natural gas these days. With this increased usage, natural gas consumption can be a significant part of an organization's operating expense, whether it be burner control systems monitoring the stoichiometric ratio of air and natural gas, or steam boilers that are required to meet varying demands, efficiency improvements can be achieved and quantified with the proper selection of flow instrumentation, whether it be small, medium, or large line sizes. Inline insertion and multi-point metering options allow you to best meet your application requirements. Many times we are not dealing with ideal metering conditions for one reason or another, which can negatively impact our natural gas flow measurements. As part of the workshop, we will look to understand common issues and how they impact our process efficiencies. There are four key considerations related to natural gas process efficiencies that we will be looking at today. The first is energy efficiency, knowing how changes in mass flow of natural gas impacts calorific value. The second is gas composition. What impact, if any, does a change in methane percentage have on overall efficiency? Third, process conditions. Am I able to measure my flow of natural gas under all operating conditions? And four, accuracy. Can I rely on my flow measurement to help optimize the efficiency of my process? An energy efficiency of 100% would be ideal, ensuring that the energy provided by your natural gas source is fully utilized. While that perfect burn may be difficult to achieve, it is feasible to reach efficiency numbers in the mid to higher 90s. Given varying process conditions, it is best to measure the mass flow in order to better understand your gross calorific value at any given time. The GCV is also known as the higher heating value. The lower heating value is another measure of available thermal energy produced by a combustion of fuel, measured as a unit of energy per unit mass or volume of a substance. This will also be referred to as either net calorific value or lower calorific value. In contrast to the HHV, the LHV considers energy losses such as the energy used to vaporize water, although its exact definition is not uniformly agreed upon. One definition is to simply subtract the heat of vaporization of the water from the higher heating value. This treats any H2O formed as a vapor. The energy required to vaporize the water, therefore, is not released as heat. LHV calculations assume that the water component of a combustion process is in vapor state at the end, as opposed to the HHV, which assumes that all of the water remains in a liquid state. Ideal operation occurs at the stoichiometric point. The highest efficiency occurs in the blue zone to the right. Operation to the left of the stoichiometric point results in incomplete gas combustion and production of carbon monoxide with a greatly lowered efficiency in presence of unburned gas in the flue gas. Operation to the right of the stoichiometric point results in excess air, which is heated by the flame. The heat is carried out in the flue gas, resulting in efficiency loss. The excess oxygen also results in an increase in NOx production. Mass flow measurement of both the natural gas and air feeds will account for changes in gas pressures and temperatures that are not accounted for in pure volumetric measurements allowing you to better keep your efficiencies within the blue zone. 
the second consideration we want to look at involves the component breakdown of natural gas. Natural gas composition can vary throughout different regions of the world. In some instances, you can also see seasonal changes in the composition. We need to consider how to best account for variances in the methane and ethane content, as well as other gas constituents, when they occur. For an accurate flow measurement, the actual gas composition is an important consideration when selecting and calibrating your preferred flow meter technology. Differences in composition will impact the gross calorific value of the fuel being burned. You also see the density change, which is one of the variables in a simplified mass flow equation. By properly addressing these variances, we can ensure that our flow measurement is optimized to maintain the appropriate air to natural gas ratio. When looking to achieve our maximum efficiencies, there are technologies that have the capability of storing multiple calibrations to optimize performance. In many cases, input from a gas analyzer can be used to switch to a calibration that best represents the existing gas composition. This approach will minimize inaccuracies related to the specific thermophysical properties of a given composition. Our third consideration is understanding how flow range turndown could impact our measurement. Many applications have varying demands. For example, you may see a very low flow pilot condition to keep a piece of equipment in standby mode that suddenly requires ramping up to 50% capacity or more. Properly sizing and selecting for these conditions requires clearly defined minimum and maximum flow values. As the graph illustrates, there is significant difference between the more common technologies used. The standard flow range of turndown of thermal often exceeds the optional turndown capabilities of technologies such as vortex, differential pressure, and multivariable. There are also differences in the flow velocity that a given technology can measure. Some are better at lower and higher flow rates than others. The last consideration we will take a look at today is flow meter accuracy. For many of these applications, we do not require custody transfer level measurements. We are looking for accurate and repeatable readings without breaking the bake to achieve them. Plus or minus 1% of reading are typical accuracies under ideal conditions. Repeatability of our measurement is also important when looking to maintain a proper air to natural gas ratio, with a plus or minus 0.5% of reading being a typical value. These accuracies are well in line with that of common meter technologies used for the error measurements, allowing us to maintain our optimal ratio for an efficient burn. We always need to keep in mind that published accuracies are based on ideal conditions that result in fully developed velocity flow profiles. If our meter run has insufficient upstream and downstream pipe lengths, we need to understand what amount of inaccuracy can be tolerated in order to explore options that will allow us to achieve our target. Consult with manufacturers and their representatives to get a better understanding of how your actual piping constraints will affect flow meter performance. Another component that is often overlooked is the use of inferred variables in our flow measurements. This is when a density is assumed without the meter technology being tested on an actual calibration stand. In some cases, a lower cost air calibration might be performed and then a linear correction factor is applied to offset the differences in the gas densities. Depending upon the technology used, these equivalencies do not always account for the thermophysical properties of natural gas, such as absolute viscosity, specific heat, and thermal conductivity. Another issue you may see is that changing process conditions are not always accounted for when a density is assumed, leading to an incorrect measurement of the actual BTU content of the natural gas feed. There are industry standards that confirm that the best practice for calibrating a flow technology will utilize the actual gas and process conditions that are being measured. Natural gas calibrations add costs, but those should be easily outweighed by the added confidence that our readings are accurate and reliable. This graph represents the performance of a thermal flow meter using an air equivalency method under actual gas conditions. Other than 100% nitrogen, you cannot lay the curve for any of the other gases on top of the black air curve and expect linearity across the entire flow range 
using a simple linear k-factor adjustment. You also start seeing limitations on low or high flow capability depending upon the gas being measured. This helps illustrate that the best performance is achieved when you calibrate with actual gas under known conditions. Performing an actual gas calibration also benefits us when dealing with small variations of the methane and ethane composition. Based on thermal physical properties, a 3.6% inaccuracy will occur when composition changes from a 95.5 to a 90.10 mixture of methane and ethane. When natural gas is used as a calibration media instead of an air equivalency, our linear K factor correction is much more effective and reliable when it comes to fine tuning our readings. Given the benefits of measuring the mass flow of natural gas, it is important to know if our preferred technology will be suitable. Most common technologies measure volumetric flow and require additional pressure and temperature compensation in order to measure mass flow. Only thermal and Coriolis are recognized as mass flow technologies since they account for changes in the gas density based on their measurement principles. Let's take a closer look at the basic principles that allow thermal technology to measure mass flow. Sensor construction is simple. Flow elements are fully welded and available in either insertion or inline versions, depending upon the line size. There are no moving parts that will wear out or ports that could be plugged if the gas contains particulate. Within the thermal wells, you will find one heated and one unheated RTD creating a temperature differential. This delta T will either vary or stay fixed depending upon how you drive the circuit. A constant power circuit will measure the change in delta T as it relates to the cooling of the sensor. A constant temperature design will put more current into the heater to maintain the temperature differential as flow increases. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. There is also a relatively new hybrid design that blends the benefits of constant power and constant temperature into a single unit. The simplified thermal mass flow equation is density times velocity times area. Whether constant power, constant temperature, or hybrid, mass flow is proportional to the cooling of the sensor. Changes in pressure and temperature will affect the gas density and be accounted for when using thermal. Unless we are operating close to standard conditions, volumetric measurement will not represent the calorific value of the natural gas being fed to the process. Mass flow will tell you the full story. Let's look at an example of how changes in pressure can have a significant impact due to the compressibility of gases. In this example, we have raised the pressure by one atmosphere. It can see that the gas density and mass flow have doubled. Higher pressures equal more gas molecules by volume. Our natural gas feed under pressure will have a greater punch and our air feed will need to support it. On the other hand, changes in temperature will not have nearly as great an impact. As you can see in the example, the density and mass flow has only decreased by 11.5% even though the process temperature has doubled. Natural gas temperatures are relatively stable, but any change will have some effect on the overall calorific value of the gas. On a side note, if our process is using preheated air in the combustion process, we need to recognize that we could potentially be starving it of oxygen if we are relying on a volumetric flow reading alone for that measurement. When you start evaluating different technologies that meet your application requirements, you might want to explore costs related to installation and maintenance. Selecting an insertion type meter versus a spool piece design will minimize these expenses. You eliminate costly bypass piping and valves if you want to allow for the removal of the instrument for either maintenance or calibration without having to shut down your process. Hot tapping your process pipe and adding an isolation ball valve will simplify your installation. If you intend to use a volumetric instrument and apply pressure and temperature compensation, you also need to spend time verifying the performance of all instruments, not just the flow meter. DP type devices will also require checking the condition of the primary flow element and all associated impost tubing and valves. 
little things do add up when you're trying to ensure measurement performance. When it comes to selecting an instrument, there are other details that might apply to your specific application and industry. I'd like to take the time to share a few with you today. We touched on inaccuracies associated with insufficient straight run earlier. We often see where selected meter locations can lead to significant error due to insufficient pipe lengths upstream and downstream. This commonly occurs when meters are being added after piping designs are completed or on existing processes and in areas that are easily accessible for installation and servicing purposes. The amount of error will vary depending upon the type of obstruction and proximity to the meter. Upstream obstructions like elbows will introduce smaller errors than an item such as a modulating butterfly valve. Errors will increase as obstructions get closer to the meter location, preventing a fully developed flow profile. Errors can be anywhere from negligible up to as much as 20%. If you have a minimum accuracy requirement, you need to understand the impact this will have on your overall measurement. If there are concerns, you can look at solutions such as flow conditioning for improvements. Note that while flow conditioners make measurements more accurate, they will also introduce additional pressure, pressure loss, and we all know that permanent pressure loss is wasted energy. Just like some flow meters minimize pressure loss, different flow conditioner designs such as tab type, perforated plates, and tube bundles vary in performance. Obtaining this information from your vendors will allow for informed decisions that will help minimize these hidden process inefficiencies. With smaller line sizes, it is much easier to find a meter location with adequate straight run. Lengths of five feet or less are typically involved. However, we now need to be cognizant of the Reynolds number transitional zone. When in the transitional zone, you can observe errors up to 10%, given that the flow is neither laminar or turbulent. Unless the right technology is chosen, this can potentially limit our low-end measurement capabilities or introduce a significant inaccuracy. Again, we want to have dialogue with our vendors when conditions such as this arise. For market segments such as oil and gas, chemical and refining, it is common for instruments to be installed in Class 1, Div 1, and Div 2 hazardous areas. As such, it is important to select an instrument suitable for use in this environment. You'll want to confirm with your vendors that the product they are offering has the appropriate third-party approvals. Another item gaining more traction within the process industries is functional safety. This might further limit your options when looking at suitable technologies. You'll want to verify with your vendors that their offering has the appropriate pedigree. Without failure rate data, preferably verified by a third party, we are unable to perform a suitable analysis of our SIF that accounts for the logic solver, final element, and sensor. Safe failure fractions and safety integrity levels alone, without knowing other hardware architecture constraints, is not enough to be thorough. Having always done something a certain way doesn't mean there is not room to improve. As engineers and technicians, it is important to understand the available technologies in order to make an informed decision regarding which one provides the best results for a given application. When multiple options are available, it is best to dig deeper into the total costs of ownership, not just doing things the same as before. In summary, Look at optimizing your process by taking into account mass flow measurements in lieu of volumetric. Mass flow measurements will allow you to truly understand the BTU content of your natural gas supply. Evaluate and select a technology that ensures you meet both the high and low flow conditions of your process. Actual gas calibrations ensure the best results using a calibration equivalency can introduce additional measurement error. And when multiple technologies are suitable, consider installation and maintenance costs. For less than ideal piping conditions, understand the impact on your meter performance to determine if other system improvements need to be explored. Also ensure that the instruments selected are suitable for any site-specific safety requirements. I'm going to hold here for a moment if you'd like to take a quick screenshot of the summary for future reference.
That concludes my look at natural gas flow measurement and process efficiencies, Katie. I would be pleased to answer any questions we may have from the audience with the time remaining.